resource unit is a unit in Henley Beach that is helpful, that provides support to teachers, SSOs, and also parents. All right. So we have seven different teams at Siri, uh, ranging from birth, literally, for children who are deaf, hard of hearing. So we have newborn babies supported when they're diagnosed at birth. That team goes out and does home visits and supports in preschools and kindergartens in relation to deaf, hard of hearing. We also have special educators hearing who go into uh, school sector, primary school and secondary schools to provide advice around hearing loss and how to uh, make your classrooms more uh, acoustically accessible. We have Candice, who is our um, guru around, and I say that very, very sincerely, around assistive technology. So one of the different technologies that can be used, and we'll go into that perhaps a little later. We have a group called Conductors, who aren't musicians in <laughs> terms of conducting. They actually support children who have physical, significant physical disability. Those conductors are based at Finden High School, Kidman Park Primary School, and Trinity Gardens Disability Unit. Uh, but they can also go out to schools and preschools to provide advice around those children who have significant physical disability. We have um, a teacher, a project officer called Teaching and Learning, who is a bit like a librarian, because at CIRU we have a lot of resources, print, games, activities, and lots of sensory materials for our young people who have sensory needs, such as those with autism. So parents can borrow from Siri. There is no cost. So we're open during school days and during the school holidays. And the hours are from 8.30, 9 o'clock through to 5 every day, school day, except for Tuesdays when we close at 3. Alright, if you have friends who live in the country, um, we can post the resource to them. We have a help desk, so if you're looking for uh, activities for children who have difficulties, learning difficulties or disability, you can phone Siru and there is a person on the client help desk who can provide advice and organise resources for you, talk you through different issues. Uh, we also have a service that provides what we call access equipment. So if you have children who have physical disability, we provide things like change tables, hoists, uh, walkers, adjustments for toilets, a whole series of different things as well. We have equipment that schools can borrow to trial, um, such as sound field systems. If the trials are successful, then either the school or the parent will purchase those. So we have a broad range, and we also have teachers, project officers there, who provide training and development in schools and at zero. So that's a little bit about Siri for those who didn't know. And the transitions are really important if we're working from preschool, into preschool, preschool to school, school to secondary, and secondary school to um, post-school options or life. So transition is really about any sort of movement from one setting to another, a relationship, any changes in routines. So your children would have gone through transitions or will go through transitions or are going through transitions. They might be from home to childcare, to family daycare, to preschool, under school care, uh, school, and certainly into work life. Right. Transition points can actually be exciting they can also be fraught with difficulty and challenges. Alright? Just for any family, that could be the case. But if you have a child with a difficulty or a disability, the transition
transitions can be even more complex. And some of those complexities we'll actually go into in a moment. All right? But transitions really are actually about planning and focusing on the future. So it's your thinking of what's next and where will that lead. Now, for most parents, when they have children who don't have a difficulty or a disability, they know their child will probably go to preschool or kindy, they'll go on to junior primary, primary school, secondary school and so on. They know pretty well the trajectory or pathway of their children. That's not always the case if you have a parent who has a child with a disability. All right? um, sometimes well, they're going through grieving when they find out because everyone wants the very best for their child. But there's also the issue of, well, will my child fit into a mainstream setting? And most of our children in the government schools are in mainstream settings. But there are other options as well, and I'll go into those shortly. So transition can vary very much. What we're actually looking at is, in 2013, there was what we call the same day start policy that came in. And this offered children in preschools a stable environment for a year where they had the opportunity to learn, play and develop. And play is an absolutely key area in, for learning at all stages of life, but particularly when you're young because you're actually exploring and discovering the world. So we know that um, every child is entitled to four terms of preschool and then four terms in reception. And that's changed, as I said, because before 2013, that wasn't the case. Children can start preschool from about the age of three years, eight months. It depends on their birthday. So if they're four before May the 1st, they can start at the beginning of the year. After May the 1st, they start the next year. All right? And for children who have special or additional needs, either because they're gifted or they have a disability or developmentally have difficulties or come from culturally, linguistically challenged backgrounds, they may, but not necessarily will, depending on room in the preschool, they may be able to start two terms before other children. So they have that little bit of additional time. They may have that additional time if there's room in the preschool. We're looking at making a smooth transition to school. School, it is expected, this is the law that actually says children need to be at, uh, attending school by their sixth birthday. And generally, there's an enrolment meeting. First of all, the parents might just indicate the school they're enrolling. But they would enrol either with a preschool director of preschool, but certainly um, in relation to the school. It's really important that the parents and families are involved and have a voice. So it's about providing information around your child or the child. If they have a disability or a particular need, the principal may involve um, someone from student support services. Their services are located in each area of uh, their local education office. And in that office there are uh, psychologists, speech pathologists, what we call special educators who are teachers with expertise around different disabilities and difficulties. And we start what we call the planning or negotiated education process. Okay? You as parents and parents who have children with disability and those who don't have disability have the most knowledge about your child. You're their first educators. What we as teachers need to know is the information that you have that will help us to more effectively plan for those children. All right? And now with the National Disability Insurance Scheme coming in, there's an added complexity there because we have other service providers, 
We have families who are looking at having packages. All right. And so it's really important for families to be supported. Not every parent feels comfortable approaching an NDIS office and negotiating. So, you know, if you know of people in that situation, ask them to take someone along with them if they're not feeling comfortable so they have some support. Right? And thinking through some questions before they go, as well as having information around this is what my child has, this is what my child needs. All right? Sometimes the conversations with the preschool and the school also help inform um, the information that they would share with the planner from NDIS. Also be aware that just because a parent has a plan under NDIS, that plan isn't locked in forever. All right? There are reviews. So as a parent you can, or a carer, you can go along at the end of a period of time, you're going to review a meeting, you can actually negotiate some changes in that package, all right? So the package isn't set in stone. Has anyone had the experience of going to NDIs? And so you would probably be wonderful supports to other people in your locations in terms of sharing your experiences, if you feel comfortable doing that, okay? Because there's nothing like someone who's experienced it. Put some dot points of what are some of the things that you can do to help your child in terms of going to school? And if you have a child who has autism, or sensory needs, the most important part for them would actually be getting them used to the idea of going to a preschool school, getting familiar with the environment. All children need that, but for some children you need additional times and practices. Getting used to routines. So they're there for you to read later on, as are the following. Okay? Preparing for transition to school. Play games about school. Do some role play. All right? Have lots of talks about it. Ask children questions. Get children involved in getting ready to school. Like when you're going shopping for the lunchbox or the school bag or the pencils or whatever you're doing, get them involved in selecting those so it becomes, from that idea of going to another setting becomes familiar. And from a teacher's point of view, Think about how you're going to say goodbye. All right. I don't know if you have had the experience, but you know you have some children who really just get lost, mum and dad. I don't really need you here on the first day. To those who, oh, I really don't want to go and leave my child behind. Who's had those experiences? Some of the things that you can do at home are included here for you. Reading and sharing stories. Sharing writing activities like shopping lists and letters. Visiting places. Talk is really, really important. Okay? Playing games. If we're establishing literacy and numeracy activities, it's rhythm, it's movement, it's singing, it's sound, it's talking, it's language that is absolutely critical to developing reading and writing and math skills. We have what we call the Students with Disability Policy. And we have particular criteria for this group of children. So we have um, children who have autism, global developmental delay. Global developmental delay is usually identified when children are young. So that would be in a preschool setting usually. And by the age of about seven or eight, we would expect that those children would be seen and reviewed to see whether they needed further support or that they would perhaps um, come under a different criteria. Intellectual disability, there are children who are perfectly able to learn but learn at a slower rate because they learn, uh, they have a difficulty with learning. Right. Physical disability I think is fairly self-evident. Then we have sensory disability, which are the children who have hearing loss or are deaf, or have vision or a vision impairment or are blind. And we have speech and language disability. Those children 
once they are verified by either a speech pathologist or a psychologist in our department, receive funding um, based on their need. So just because you have that label doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get the same support as everyone else with that same label. It goes on need. So a special educator would come into the school setting and would assess the need at that time and, uh, alloc and funding would be allocated to the school for that child. We have another group of students or another group of children who don't fit the criteria that, because they have a learning difficulty. Now it might be they just have difficulty with reading or spelling or written language or math. It might be they have ADHD or ADD. It may be they have um, dyslexia. All right. Every school gets money for dyslexia uh, for learning difficulties, including those with dyslexia. All right. We don't keep. We don't know how many children in our schools have those issues because the school keeps the records themselves. Um, but we think somewhere probably around 10 to 16 percent of children might have a difficulty at any time. The blue slice of the pie are the children who have targeted funding, they have a disability, under those categories I talked about. The children who are, the slices that are red and red and white are our children with learning difficulties and that little red and white stripe, actually those children with dyslexia and more specific disabilities like dyscalculia, dyspraxia and so on. And then the slice in green are the others. And they still get support in the school, but it's in a different way. It's less targeted in terms of funding. I might have something we call an adjustment, so that the writing might be on a piece of paper next to you, so you don't have to keep looking up and down. Or it might be that I do some of the sentences in one colour, the next lot of sentences in another colour, so you don't lose your spot. Or it might be that I use a different font. If I'm dyslexic, I might use a dyslexia font, or a Comic Sans font, or a Sans Serif font, because that would help me read the words more easily. So can you see what we're doing? We're actually, as teachers, making judgments about what are the different types or levels of support that children need. They're not all the same. All right? The amount of support a child needs can also vary very much. So it might be for some children, they need a little bit every day. It might be for some children, they need it for a block of time and then they don't have any support outside the classroom or in a small group because they don't need it. But they might need a top up as time goes on. All right. So it's really important to realise that support varies very much. And that's where you as families and carers are critical. Helping to make those decisions are also based on the knowledge that you share with the teacher about your child. So you need to discuss your concerns. One of the helpful things is to have a communication strategy. Most schools either do diaries or emails, all right? Now, on behalf of all teachers, we don't necessarily want to be reading and answering emails till 10 o'clock every night. I know it's so easy to fling off an email, and I'm not saying don't, but also think about workload, okay? And talk about the ways, have a partnership with the school and the teachers on how you can support your child at home. Because what we know is, the partnership is most effective. It doesn't mean you have to spend hours teaching your child. But, you know, 20 minutes in the evening on a focused area, and it can be through play, it doesn't necessarily have to be a piece of paper, um, or, and it doesn't necessarily have to be always the child reading the book. It can be you doing something, showing or modelling or demonstrating something. And have a set time when you come back to the teacher and have a conversation with them or review. That doesn't have to be a big meeting. You know, it can be, well, I'll come back perhaps in six or seven weeks. Let's have a chat. How's the child gone so far? This is what we talked about. And then review that. Right. And the teacher will work from a strength-based career, uh, as I said. They'll look at what the child needs to learn in the curriculum, 
what's working, what's not, and where do we go to next? And the critical factor is both the teacher and the parent or carer should be talking about the difficulty with their child so they understand that they have got a difficulty. And I thought I might just highlight some very famous people who have experienced difficulties, if it would do this. Here are just some famous people who have indicated they either have speech, have, they were slow learners, speech difficulties, or were dyslexic. Recognise any names? Yeah, lots. Mm, lots. Okay. Guess what? They're all from different fields, aren't they? So we've got singers, we've got actors, we've got scientists, we've got politicians, authors, authors artists. artists, artists, absolutely. And, well, actually, there are quite a few in the royal family, I might say. Yes. <laughs> Which one? Stephen King. He's a television producer. I know who he is. I remember him as a young person. He was the feather on the end yeah. of the movie. Yeah. Wow, well, there you are. Fame. <laughs> okay, so there are a lot of people, just because you have a difficulty at school and in learning, doesn't mean you are not going to be successful in life. Alright? So, welcome. Have we got a spare PowerPoint? No, it's okay. So, if we look at learning difficulties, these are some of the things that you might notice. And these would be things as a parent then that you'd think, okay, if I know this is coming up, what can we do and this is what I need to share. So some children may lack confidence and motivation. They're not risk takers. Okay? So we, we support them. Okay? It could be because they have a difficulty and they won't risk take, or it could be they just sit back and listen to others and don't appear to be confident. They might have poor listening, concentration, attending skills. Now, we all zone out at times. I'm sure you've done that this morning. That's normal behaviour. But not when you're missing out constantly, because then you learn odd bits of information or you miss out. Organising skills. You know, if you've got children who don't know where their jumper is. When you come to school and you open up a book and you think which side of the uh, page does the margin go or the line across the dock, you know, how do you organise yourself? Or I'm okay in the morning when I'm fresh, but then I sort of wilt a little bit and I forget things. Difficulty following more than one instruction. And that's sometimes because of the way we as adults speak. We flood information. Now I want you to do this, this, this and this. You know, whereas it might be we just pause a little bit in between. I'd like you to go and get your pencil, your shoes. There was actually some research done in Victoria by a professor called Professor Kathy Rowe. And this would have been about eight, nine years ago. And she and her researchers actually interviewed 15,000 school children from early years school through to the end of high school. Really, they had difficulties because there was too much information bombarded in one chunk. So what they did in those schools they went into, they actually got the teachers to actually pause after a couple of instructions or a bit of information, and they found there was a significant improvement, believe it or not, in their literacy skills. And that that research was actually replicated down in the southern area of Adelaide and Florio Peninsula. And they found that in junior primary, particularly the boys improved in literacy just because the instructions and information was broken down. So it is really, really powerful. Okay? Now, I just demonstrated that by going, really, really <laughs> powerful. Okay, so it doesn't mean you speak slowly. <laughs> it's just the pause. Okay, so children have to do with handwriting coordination. And that means, like you did in your handwriting activity, you had difficulty finishing the task. And, you know, you're never going to feel happy if you never, and successful, if you never get to finish anything. 
is half finished. Some children who have difficulties might be a behaviour problem, but not necessarily. Uh, the ones that I used to worry about as a teacher were those who were very quiet and could hide in the background. And they had lovely little supports around them, wonderful people who would support them, and they'd work out wonderful strategies, but all very nice, but it didn't help me know what they knew and what I had to do. That was an issue. And certainly we know some of them will have difficulties in one or more of the learning areas, and they might have poor memory difficulties. Other supportive strategies you can use all right, so we can look at things like flashcards, visuals, videos, computers. If you've got a child who has a difficulty with reading a text, particularly as they get up into high school, why not watch the video first, providing it's reasonable? Okay, it gives them the sense of the story. It won't give them all the beauty of the text, but it gives them a sense. So when students are writing, highlight the key words or the notes. Okay. Provide diagrams, charts and outlines, pictures. And colour is really important. Colour is a good memory trigger. If you have a child with dyslexia, you could use colour, you can use bold, never underline. Because when you underline words for a child with dyslexia, the words actually run into one another. It's harder for them to decode and read. For some students or some children who have difficulty in but are very strong in listening, having things read to them, talk things through, listening to audio tapes, recording themselves and playing it back. Um, for some, it's actually doing by making. Making and doing helps them learn. All right? So it's through seeing things, experiments, field trips, activities and role play. I know myself, for example, if I see someone doing something, it makes it easy for me, when I'm learning something new, then to be able to do it later on, because I've got the sense of what it could be. I may not get all the things right, but I've, I've got an idea of how to go about it. That helps. The interesting thing is, for some, Actually having music in the background helps. You know, there are a lot of assistive technology tools around. So if you have a child or a young person who has difficulty reading, you can scan texts and have software that will actually read the text back to you. Now, it doesn't mean you never read independently, but it does support. And again, it helps the young person keep up with their peers um, there are um, OCRs, optical character recognition, where you can scan. And do you want to do a quick conversation on that one, Candice? Oh, basically just that there's a lot of technology now that's very accessible um, and affordable that can convert the printed text if um, you're unable to read that text for any reason and it will take a little image of it straight away, whether it's on your iPhone or, a cam um, or another phone or iPad, and then it'll, in a matter of seconds, convert that into um, speech um, and have it there in front of you that's then editable text as well. So it can really make um, someone who's needing to fill out a form or anything like that, whether it's because they have learned difficulty, English is an additional language, um, it becomes an accessible piece of content, which can be very empowering for someone who cannot read. And, you know, some people talk about it's cheating, but it's actually not. It's a wonderful adjustment that will support them through life. All right? If it means they can access and they can actually participate really effectively, that's what we should be using. And it's very much supporting the um, people with a visual impairment as well. Certainly in terms of writing a written language, there are different software programs that help children and young people organise their writing. They have word banks that they can actually go to to help them with their spelling and their words. Word prediction. All right. Again, predicting words um, so that it takes away the demand from memory and increases their speed. Voice recognition software. Okay, so if we're transitioning to a secondary school, this is a really critical time for young people, families and carers. It's exciting and it's scary. 
All right. And you know, young people are really excited about going on to year eight, and then they hear the horror stories, usually from their best friends or their best friends' siblings. Okay. But it is. It's a real step to the future into adulthood. So, you know, again, it's that transition time, sort of confidence, providing support, talking it out. But it is the start of what we really have is a new culture and new expectations because they're young adults now. And so, what are some of the things that look different and that we need to talk to our young people about, our children? Can we talk about the different types of classrooms in some cases? They might look different. The numbers will vary because they're not necessarily going to be in one or two or three areas in a school. And, you know, there will be variety throughout the day. They're going to interact with more teachers and adults. And that might need queuing, particularly if you have a young child with autism. They're going to need to be uh, queued into that and supported through that process. There are going to be different expectations because suddenly they're going to have to be more independent. They're going to have to take more responsibility for themselves in terms of their homework, in terms of the, uh, task completion, you know, keeping schedules and timelines, um, in terms of moving from one location to another, even in terms of selecting their subjects. That's a really big to ask, particularly if you're not sure where you're going in the future. So, you know, you're making decisions that could impact on your future quite significantly. So, again, like in primary school, it has to be a planned approach. Okay? Parents and young people need to visit and orientate not only the school, but hopefully look not only the school buildings and the location, but the spaces the student might be in. You know, having a look at some of the timetables and talking through what that timetable or schedule for that young person will look like. Where will they put their books in their, where's their locker? Because they're often used to having their things with them next to the classroom or in the class. You know, in a high school setting, that's quite different. It might be they have to take them around or put them in a locker. So how do they organise themselves? You know, develop skills on how to manage their own learning. There won't necessarily be someone there checking at the end of each lesson what they're doing. It's actually about if it's actually about making this oh, sorry. It's coming. It's coming. Making this oh we've gone way over. It's about making decisions on how they're going to schedule and timeline their work. Okay. What are they going to do? And the last one is I've put on there some websites. They're varied. The one at the top called LD Online is a really good website around learning difficulties. Good advice, not only for teachers, but for parents as well. What do I do when my child has a learning difficulty? How do I approach the school? What are some strategies I can use to help them with reading or written language or study skills or organisation? That's a really excellent website. There's another one called All Kinds of Minds, again, around different learning difficulties. The Spurled website is excellent. It talks about different types of learning difficulties and dyslexia, but they also have little phonics books that can be printed off um, to share with children, and they're all free. They've just put up a new program called the Intensive Language um, program, and that was a program to develop literacy skills for, actually was developed for inmates in, in the prison and has been trialled there, but it's actually really good for secondary students who have difficulty with literacy. We've got our CIRA website up there and you've got the postcard for that. Others around disability, the UNESCO website's good. And then I've put in a couple around dyslexia, 